In a pluralistic society, we are all challenged to become part of the whole without sacrificing our individuality. For those who belong to a minority group, this challenge is heightened by the fact that simply being themselves may carry a stigma or raise suspicion. This might mean being an involved citizen in your community, only to discover that some neighbors don't trust you because you're a Muslim. Or becoming a feminist, getting involved in women's issues, and realizing that the women's movement may look down on your Hindu practice or sideline your issues as an immigrant or a person of color. It may mean embracing your Buddhism and finding that the Buddhist faith doesn't really address your experience as a woman. The women profiled in this film, Leila Almariati, Shamita Das Dasgupta, and Mushim Ikeda Nash, are activists who have faced these challenges head on. They believe that no one should have to choose between multiple and vital identities. For these women and many others, their faith fuels their activism. As they engage with their religions in the American context, they are each becoming pioneers of new identities, new communities, and new movements. I grew up in a family which emphasized religion in a very funny way. We weren't taught to adhere to any kind of religious process, but we were taught to live an honest life. Our parents talked to us a lot about philosophy. And I mean, to me, there's nothing more religious than justice and equality. I grew up all around India, wherever my father's job took the family. And I've been exposed to activism since I was born. My father was involved in the freedom movement. So while I was growing up, I would meet these women who were like these tiny, frail women wearing white saris, which is very typically Bengali and later on find out that they were revolutionaries during the freedom movement. Uh, and somebody knew jiu-jitsu, uh, someone had taken a gun and led an insurrection. But I also saw that these are the same women who would come home and cook a meal and raise children and do other things. So I never saw these as dichotomies. I came to this country when I was 19, basically followed my husband. And when I came here, I had all of these questions about women's lives. And guess what was happening here? The women's movement and the civil rights movement. In 85, I and five other women uh, co-founded Manavi, which is the organization for South Asian women in New Jersey and found out that that's the first organization in the South Asian community in this country to be established around women's issues, and especially violence against women. All six of us who ended up founding Manavi, we were all runaways from the mainstream feminist movement. We felt that our issues were not being covered. We felt that we were being sidelined. So we started talking about how can we work within our community and actually, at that point, we had no idea what women needed. What we wanted to know, literally, was what's the status of women in our community. And that's how we started and found out very quickly that many, many women were experiencing violence within the home, within the family. Where my religious training came from, was when women would come to us and say, I can't do anything about the abuse that I'm facing. Why not? Well, my religion wouldn't allow it. Or you know how it is in our culture. 
that's when I said, well, you know, I got to start learning about religion and culture much more so I could at least talk to these women directly as to what it means and what it doesn't mean. And um, that's when I read Quran a lot. And that's when I read different works within the Hindu philosophy. And at least when women would come and say that in my culture or my religion, I could say, where? And of course, you can show me places where the religion or the culture disempowers women. But here, I can show you a bunch more instances where it's empowering to women. And my question would be, who do you think is benefiting from that? If we take only the disempowering parts to be our culture and kind of the empowering parts become invisible, then who's benefiting? And women really understood that. I actually tended to avoid political action as a younger person because I felt there was always so much anger involved and often a kind of self-righteousness and certainly a split between the we who see what is wrong and what needs to be corrected and the they who are blind in some way. What's most important for us as Buddhist activists and for myself is to continually examine my own practice, my own heart, to say, am I acting out of fear? Am I acting out of hatred? Am I acting out of clinging to some idea of what is right and what is better? My mother's family actually is very Buddhist in Hawaii, but she had moved to the mainland when she went to college and it sort of had never taken with her because when World War II came, the Japanese temples and Japanese language programs were shut down. And then my father's family were pretty much in isolation in Indiana and they didn't practice anything. So we grew up basically without religion, although my father loved nature and did tell me that nature was so beautiful that someone had to have created it. As I was growing up, um, I had a lot of existential questions, partially because of the times. It was a Cold War era, and in public school in Ohio, we regularly had these nuclear air raid drills. So actually, it was a threat of nuclear war that for me precipitated the question of, well, if there is a god, then why doesn't this god fix this terrifying situation? And so then it began to reformulate as to, well, what is it in people that creates inhumanity to one another? And that, I would say, led me directly into Buddhism. When I started practicing Zen in Ann Arbor, Michigan, it was in a Korean lineage. And it was an experimental form of practice for people in North America. The practice combined with living in the temple, in the community, under this vow of poverty, really left me with some very huge, deep questions, which basically had to do, I guess, a way we Americans would think about it with hierarchy, patriarchy, decision-making models. As a woman, I had a lot of questions about the position of women in this system. So I went to Korea. I was there for eight months in the monastery, which was an amazing experience. I lived and trained with a group of Korean nuns on a mountainside. And uh, due to some really uh, uh, difficult and and then some inexplicable factors, I ended up getting pregnant in Korea. 
in this monastery, which is, of course, really against the rules in every way and under very unhappy circumstances. There was a lot of pressure. And I came back to the United States and was faced with, should I have an abortion or not? Now, I came back with literally about $15 in my pocket and no savings. So the, obviously the answer was yes. But I'd just been through this very intense meditative practice. And the first precept of Buddhism actually is do not kill but cherish all life. And so I'm very firmly pro-choice as an American woman, but pro-choice actually does mean a choice. And my choice in that situation was just, I, I felt I have to have this baby. So I started transitioning back to lay life. I got some work. Women tend to operate a lot through relationships. So we're often in a caretaking role. So how to honor who we are as women and bring that forward into our spiritual life and practice. It's a dimension that still needs to be explored. And so I've begun to really sort of read and question and talk to people about sexism in the Buddhist community. And I would do a quarterly column for the Buddhist Peace Fellowship Journal on the subject of Buddhist practice and family life. The Quran says in this life, the struggle is to show your devotion to God in service. And so it just puts me under an obligation to be the caretaker of his creation. So whether that's in environmental issues, that's having to do with fellow human beings who are living in poverty, whether that has to do with um, you know, um, just raising my children or what kind of a physician I am. It permeates everything, so it's totally interconnected in a way that um, makes it impossible to ignore. We were raised in Hollywood Hills and went to regular school and religion really was not an important part of our household as we were growing up. Knowing that we were Palestinian was emphasized, but being Muslim was sort of secondary to that identity, so that really didn't start to become an issue for me until I hit adolescence. And I just one day was sitting in the mosque and listening to the Adhan, which I couldn't understand a single word of because I don't know Arabic. But it was a moment where I felt like there was some, some voice there calling me. And from then on, I just began my own journey through Islam, studying the Quran by myself and reading more and more as I got older. So it was a self-taught kind of a process. Like any Muslim, I try to manifest my faith in my actions. And so I have my religious obligations, which are to pray five times a day, fast in the month of Ramadan, um, pay charity. And we did go on the pilgrimage about 10 years ago. In terms of how my spiritual beliefs affect activism and how the activism affects my spirituality, they're interconnected. Although the activist part of me, I think, is probably something I was born with, and I've tried to suppress it at times because it kind of interferes with work and school and everything else, but I can't. The Muslim community is good about building mosques and Muslim schools and even making arrangements to have mortuaries on our own premises to conform with our requirements when somebody passes away. But if, as far as reaching out to the needy in the general population, which is a religious obligation, we've done it in kinds of fits and starts. And so I've been volunteering at the Ummah Free Clinic, which is in South Central Los Angeles. It was started by Muslim medical students several years ago. Um, 
And within the past five years, it's really been up and running, it's catering to the needs of the indigent population in South Central LA. It's the only free clinic in that area, uh, if you can imagine that, considering the great need that is there. And that was the 19th, so obviously she must have had her tattoo. And it's been important for me because I felt that I need to be able to contribute within my own profession as a physician. The patients know it's a Muslim clinic, but religion is not discussed in any of the interaction. So it's just been a privilege to be able to be a part of that project. But I think there were a couple of normal packs that we tried to put in place. Yeah. No religion is static. As religious traditions travel across the globe, they mingle with the cultures and peoples of the places in which they are practiced to create dynamic new forms of belief, values, worship, and organization. As America increasingly becomes a religiously pluralistic nation, it's making its own imprint on the faiths of the world and is being changed in return. As American women practice Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, or any other tradition, each brings to it the lens of her own experience and perspective. Phrases like, this is how Hinduism views women, or that is how women practice Islam, do not acknowledge the diversity of understandings and expressions of these religious traditions. Each faith is as dynamic as its practitioners. And now, as America's new religious reality includes vital expressions of Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, each religious tradition is being examined, changed, reaffirmed, and reclaimed by women like Layla, Mushim, and Shamita. I think the mainstream community still has a lot of problem working with smaller, um, smaller communities who, who may be different in so many ways, different in terms of religion, different in terms of language, uh, in uh, legal needs, and so many other ways. I think the way we started working was we tried to see what was a woman, South Asian woman's life like. And we've many things. We found out that her life is not just here that it stretches over wherever she's from, maybe from Pakistan, maybe from India, maybe from Bangladesh. The other thing is that the laws of her native country and this country both affect her. So how do we get to a position where these don't contradict in such a way that renders her literally helpless? When we started Manavi, we felt very, very strongly that it has to be a non-sectarian space. As feminists, we're always put into a lot of difficulty when we recognize religion, because feminism itself kind of sees it as perhaps harmful even, and historically it has harmed women. So how do we work through that? Uh, and, but the fact remains that if we are going to, we were going to be sensitive to women's needs, we had to recognize religion. Women came with faith, different kinds of faiths. The women held on to their faith so strongly during crisis. So within the safe home that Manavi runs, what we try to do is to make provisions for different kinds of practices and faiths. For example, when Muslim women came and they wanted halal, we said yes. There are vegetarian women, Hindu vegetarian women, who would not eat from the same utensils if it touches any kind of non-vegetarian food. So we had to, we have kept a separate set of totally vegetarian utensils. There were prayer spaces women needed. It's not that we took one perspective and said this is what it has to be, or no religion, nobody has to do anything, everybody lives a, uh, in a way that's common to everybody. But what we tried to do was to make space. There are these rules, there are these customs coming from the Asian tradition of Buddhism, which are very difficult for Americans and American women in general to, to accept as being fair or right or, or good. Although, as with any tradition, 
to study it more closely, even when if one doesn't agree with it, is always instructive. There is such a thing as throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and there is concern among some American Buddhists of saying, well, if we just put, take a little of this and a little of that and a little of something the Dalai Lama said and a little of something that Thich Nhat Hanh said and everything that we like and put it together and call it Buddhism, it might be something that's helpful to us, but it might not actually be Buddhism. But one of the great contributions to world Buddhism and to the history of Buddhism is that in the West, because we've been through the women's movement, because we've been through feminism, we were unwilling to take a back of the bus position. And there now are women teachers and women leaders, both lay and monastic, within American Buddhism. And what I'm interested in are the embodied forms of Buddhist practice and, and teachings and realizations that American women and Western women can bring forth to add a new dimension to traditional Buddhism. When I was living in the Green Gulch Zen community for a year, they asked me to do a traditional form of entry into that Zen community where you sit and sit and sit and sit and people come out and sort of despise you. And you have to show your supreme determination to enter into the temple. And for me it was complicated because I was breastfeeding but my kid wasn't around so it was really getting pretty painful. So during the breaks I would run up to this trailer I was living in and take these hot showers and try to express the milk. And I was standing in the shower and I was laughing and trying to express this breast milk and I suddenly thought, you know, as far as I know, no Zen patriarch has ever had precisely this experience of Buddhist practice. The other thing that Islam says is that God created mankind to be a vicegerent for him on earth. So, for example, when the war started in Bosnia, and the reports came about, about massive rapes as a, as a weapon of war. We couldn't not say something or do something. And although, of course, I identified with these women because they were Muslim, that really was part of it. But then there was this drive that, no, we can't just let someone else do it. The Muslim Women's League is basically an organization of women activists, and our mission really is to strengthen the role of Muslim women in society. We started when women from the feminist community and interfaith community were as appalled as we were at what was happening in Bosnia, and they looked to the Muslim community for some form of leadership. So we established ourselves as one of the organizations that's a faith-based women's group that is dedicated to the values of Islam itself, but at the same time is willing to look at ourselves critically, especially on the issue related to women, and say, are we living up to what our own religious values are? Without having to think that we're doing that because someone else thinks Islam is oppressive of women, but because we ourselves as Muslims want to help other women around the world. The U.S. women's movement, feminism in general, especially among the more radical elements, view Islam itself as completely a negative factor in women's lives. But I think they have a negative view of much of organized religion as far as women are concerned. If you look at the history of Catholicism, for example, I mean, they will have a bone to pick with that. Orthodox Judaism has its own issues as far as women go. So you find in this sort of secular movement that religion in general has, has given women the short end of the stick. So why try to work with something that is flawed? In other words, the religion, just dump it all together and let's go with secularism. The trouble is, what that means is they're not listening to women themselves. The very women they want to help are women who say, no, I want to be Catholic, I want to be Muslim, and I want to be an Orthodox Jew, but I want my life to build, still be better. And I don't feel that I have to dump my religion in order to make my life better. And I think the women's movement has completely missed that fact. They also are preoccupied with the headscarf of Muslim women and the way women dress to the point of absurdity. At the same time, you don't hear voices speaking out for Turkish women or women in Uzbekistan who cover their hair 
and are excluded from government jobs, from university positions. And these are women who may be coming from villages where they would normally not be getting an educational opportunity. They're conservative, so they're not going to completely abandon everything. They're getting to the universities and they're being turned away. And their families are saying, well, you know, what? we wasted everything to send you there in the first place. So how can that advance the rights of women? What we have to realize as a country, as a people, is that the way we dress is not the reason why women have advanced the way they have in the United States. And it's also important to realize that there are places where we have not advanced as much as we would like to go, whether it's in terms of our economic strength, whether it's in issues related to teen pregnancy. And those factors are not helped or hindered by how we dress. Women who belong to minority religious and ethnic communities need to be advocates, not only for the visibility and inclusion of women, but also for the rights of their community as a whole. For Leila, Mushim, and Shemita, gender, religious, and ethnic discrimination are not separate issues, but are interconnected problems that must be explored, analyzed, and actively combated. I've begun to really sort of read and question and talk to people about race, ethnicity, what we call the, the isms, racism, sexism, in the Buddhist community. And for the most part, the American Zen groups, which were the ones I was familiar with, were basically attracting white, educated, middle-class congregations. And so, basically, the question was, why are some of these groups so predominantly white? And as people began to explore this question through the lens of uh, non-Buddhist diversity work, we found that the forms of what have been called institutionalized racism, in other words, not personal or individual prejudice of any sort, but that somehow these institutional forms are so deeply embedded, they're systemic in other words, that sometimes people of color who have come to some of these predominantly white American Buddhist communities have felt very uncomfortable. They felt out of place. They haven't felt seen. That kind of experience is part of the work of the groups that I've been working with to see what it is and how we can try to heal some of the wounds that have caused these forms of separation. I guess I'm just afraid. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there, you know? Just being in a room full and it's all white people and me. It's letting people know that two major centers are getting together around areas of diversity. In one sense, we're bringing diversity work to some of these American Buddhist communities. But how can we as Buddhists also take some of the spiritual work that we're doing out to the communities beyond ourselves. And something that's of great interest and excitement to me is that I've begun to work as a professional diversity trainer and diversity facilitator, and specifically with my, uh, my Buddhist uh, colleague, Larry Yang, have been working to develop a form of diversity training that is grounded in contemplative or meditative practice. Personally, because I don't cover my hair, um, I don't really stand out as a Muslim woman. So I haven't had uh, any of the negative uh, interactions that some of my friends and even my you know, relatives have had. 
Um, I did have one patient tell me, though, that several of her friends were not going to come and see me anymore. As Muslims try to have a voice and speak for themselves, there's a counter-reaction to say, you're just an apologist, why don't you admit how bad your religion is and that it's because of your religion that this thing happened in the first place. And some of the attacks have really been difficult. They're not personal, which, you know, nothing is a personal issue here. But when you just see your something you hold so incredibly dear, just to be dragged through the mud by somebody else, it's... It's just painful. So that, even though it hasn't made me behave differently, it has had a tremendous effect on my psyche and my attitude. There's this fear that, okay, we know that people whose immigration status is in question are the ones that are most vulnerable. We're assuming that as American citizens, we're kind of okay these things are reassured over and over again, but we don't really know. People are not sure. There's so many cases of people being stopped and um, um, questioned or concerns about wiretapping and things like that. So there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, and mostly uncertainty about what is going to happen with us as a community. Definitely we need to do a lot of work. And before ending uh, today, we have an announcement by uh, Dr. Laila Marayati. I just wanted to announce the formation of a new humanitarian organization, but also to react to the uh, assaults on our efforts to help our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world after the closure of the Holy Land Foundation, Benevolence International, and Global Relief, which were three major organizations in this country. It psychologically has the effect of saying, because of this appearance that we may be in collusion with terrorists, we want to cut off the ability of the American Muslim community to have any effect on Muslims around the world, whether it's in Palestine, or in Kashmir, or even in the Philippines, in Mindanao, where there's tremendous suffering of, of Muslims there, China, any place. And we need to feel like we can fight back and say we have done nothing wrong, we are not engaged in anything illegal, and if our only crime is that we support a group that's unpopular, then come and shut us down again, because we're going to come back again to support them. When Manavi first started, the South Asian community was horrified um, because it assumed that there was, everything was wonderful, that there was nothing that was going on within our community uh, that needed the kind of attention that we were bringing. Domestic violence is, is a horrible thing to talk about. Violence within the family, women being oppressed in certain ways, that was not okay to talk about. And in fact, the South Asian community has always been considered a model minority. So we were vilified, absolutely, uh, called homebreakers. People talked to my husband, saying that they would never allow their wives to talk to me. Well, we wanted to just brainstorm some stuff with you today. And the application is due by the 26th, okay. by the way, so it's very clear. Most of the religious institutions in New Jersey will not have us. When the, the festivals occur, the temples or the Jain temples or um, the mosques will not allow us to go in and talk to the women. However, there are almost 20 organizations around the country now, pretty similar focusing on violence against women in the South Asian community. The existence of these and the, the, the fact that we have survived for so long does show, does indicate that the community has accepted us to a certain degree. So I had Joshua in April of 1989, and at that point, thoroughly felt that that my spiritual practice should be to to raise this child, 
and to, in addition to everything else one wants to give your children, to give him a spiritual education. My interpretation of being a Buddhist mother is to try to avoid forcing my beliefs and my values on my child. Because after all, those beliefs and values have come through my experience, and I want him to have his own experience. And Buddhism, particularly as it's interpreted by Westerners, is a practice of deep inquiry. As I was raising my son, what I wanted to give him most deeply was a basic, actually physical or, or whole body mind sense of the basic okayness of the universe that I wanted to transmit to him. So when he was a baby, I would just sit with him. I'd just sit with him in my lap and, and just hold him and breathe. And it wasn't that I was trying to meditate or do something fancy or spiritual, but I just was with him. We venerate the three treasures and give thanks for this meal, the work of many beings and the offering of other forms of life. And then as he's grown up, I've just had conversations with him about our experiences through the lens of the Buddhist understanding. And it's always been clear to me that he can choose to self-identify however he wants, or he can, as he grows into an adult, form his own beliefs based on his own experiences. But I would offer to him what my understanding is. We have three children who are 10, almost eight, and two. And figuring out how to teach them Islam is, is very difficult because I don't have anything to follow. There was no modeling in my home to say this is how we do it. I did not have a connection to my background. The Arabic spoken sounded like gibberish to me. I had no idea about a single fundamental aspect of my religion until I was in my teens. And I thought, well, at least I should do better than that and teach them some of the basics, to the point where we have them enrolled in a Muslim school, not so much to protect them from the evils of American society, because that's just sort of a fantasy that a lot of people have, but to at least let them be grounded in their religion, let their identity be built around other children in an environment where they are in the majority, because it won't last, especially at this tender age of grade school where you're so vulnerable to the, what happens in the environment around you. So, um, so they're there, they're, all their friends are Muslim. My son had a slumber party with 15 boys over, and before they went to eat, they all prayed the Maghrib, you know, the sunset prayer together, which I was look, thinking about that, thinking, you know, in my life, that kind of thing never would have happened. At some point, I'm going to have to figure out how to ease them into this world that at this point in time is not welcoming them here. But they belong here, and they're Americans just like anybody else. We don't talk about that. We don't promote a victim mentality in any way, shape, or form. But at some point, it will have to really address that. My daughter was born in 1970. I wanted her to learn what it is like to be an Indian woman. I wanted her to think about race and immigration in this country. I wanted her to experience um, being a third world woman in a first world country, living in a first world country. So um, I, quite frankly, I wanted her to be politically conscious. So it was. Um, you know, and, and it did work for a while uh, when during her teenage years I thought, oh, it's never going to work. It's just, oh my God, I've done everything wrong. But she blossomed. And she's an activist too. She chose her field of activism as healthcare. And we, we have written together so much. And I have a grandson now who is also in a joy in my life. 
I truly hope that he recognizes the male privileges. I hope he has a brown skin so he understands uh, what it is like to be a brown skin person. It's important to be marginalized in some ways because I think it provides you with a political understanding of, of a society and a system that nothing else does. And I hope he gets the benefit of that. For Leila, Mushim, and Shemita, the quest to create a new religious activism is an ongoing and dynamic one. As these women engage with their faiths in the American context, they're on a journey whose destination is as yet unknown. What we do know is that this journey will be as varied and complex as the women themselves. <laughs>